Thank you so much. It's great to be here. You know, you're a good bunch. What the worship. Just a great time of worship and enjoying God's presence. Hallelujah. God's so good. There we go. I want to share today on the, the topic of raising sons and daughters in the faith. Raising sons and daughters in the faith. Now, we're all familiar with the, the concept that um, humanity grows over time. Um, I have a son and a daughter, and because I have a son and a daughter who are now married, I have grandchildren. I've got four grandchildren from our son. Our daughter is still working on it, doing a great job, I'm sure. But four grandkids from our son, three girls, and a boy, a little Sammy boy, who's now two. And you know, I was really pleased when Sammy came along because that meant that the Adrian Turner name was going to continue. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for the girls. Now, they're going to get married probably and not have the Turner name, right? But uh, Sammy Boy is going to keep the Turner name. And uh, so the Turner name lives on. Now, and that, we understand that principle, right? Uh, now, I want us to, to recognise that uh, that's actually God's design. And I want to show it to you from Scripture. We're going to look at look at a. Uh, oops, let's get this on. Yep. When um, remember the burning bush incident, where Moses uh, is confronted by this amazing scene of the bush burning, but it's not it's not being consumed, and uh, and God speaks to him. One of the things that God said to him is, uh, "I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham." Now Abraham was not his father. We don't know who's Moses' father's name was. We just know that he had a father. We know he had a mother. We meet her, but we don't know her name either. We know he had a sister called Miriam. But he did have a father, and it wasn't Abraham. He says, I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And I'm the God of Jacob. So here's God pointing out to Moses that uh, his intention for his creation was that there would be generational growth taking place, that uh, humanity was meant to continue on to grow, to expand. And, you know, it's doing that. There's nearly 8 billion of us now on the face of the earth. Not quite, but we're growing. From Adam and Eve, quite a while back, we're now nearly at 8 billion. It's, it's working. God's plan. Humanity is working. Now, I want to open up this thought of uh, raising sons and daughters in the faith. Because obviously we've been talking about natural generation, uh, natural parents producing natural children. That's part of God's plan and purpose. But God intends us also as Christians to raise spiritual sons and daughters. That's His purpose. That's the purpose of the church. Is actually to raise spiritual sons and daughters who love Jesus, serve in His kingdom. Amen? This is a Christian church. <laughs> Amen. It's a Pentecostal church, right? Amen. So we're going, to, we're going to follow that theme through just a little bit. It was um, probably the Apostle Paul who really clearly understood this dynamic. And I want to look at a couple of scriptures that he that he uh, alludes to this very clearly. In First Corinthians chapter four, he says, "I'm writing this not to you, this to the church at Corinth, okay, the congregation there." I'm writing this not to your shame, but to warn you as my dear children. So here's, here's the apostle claiming a whole congregation as his spiritual children. Okay? I'm, I'm wanting to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. You see that the, the apostle Paul saying, through the grace of God, through the preaching of the gospel, you've responded and you've become my children in the faith in that regard because they believe through the message that he preached. And then again, he says even more clearly, he says in, uh, in later on in that same uh, chapter, I urge you therefore to imitate me for this reason I've sent you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my ways of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Here's Paul now recommending a young man, Timothy, 
who he recognises as his son in the faith, and he's recommending his son to this congregation in Corinth. Then he says something even a little bit more clearly in Philippians to the congregation at Philippi in chapter 2. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. He's, he's saying something about the character that he recognises in Timothy, the son in the faith that he has been able to raise up. He's seeing something in this young man. And he's wanting to identify, he's wanting these, the, the congregation in Philippi to be able to recognise that in, in uh, Timothy as well. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone else looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. He's a key marker. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. That's a powerful statement. What a recommendation the great apostle is making for this young man, Timothy, who he's had the privilege of working with. Now, I want us to go on a journey. We're actually going to work our way through the book of Acts. And uh, we're going to discover how this father, spiritual father-son relationship actually developed in reality. And my hope and prayer is that uh, you and I will both be both challenged and encouraged by the reality of the relationship that uh, God is able to build between these two men of God over a period of time. So let's, let's jump into it. Insights into how a father-son relationship develops. We're going to start in Acts 16. You can feel free to follow this in your Bibles. We're going to work our way through starting in verse, uh, chapter 16, and then there'll be a, probably five or six different passages we'll look at briefly uh, through there. And let's do a little bit of exegesis, a bit of a discovery, and see what, uh, what God's Word can say to us. So, Acts 16 is where we first meet Timothy. Paul came to do, then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived. So he lives in Lystra, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Verse 2, the believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. He's going to hold that verse there for a moment. We're going to come back to that verse in another point, in, another, uh, in the next point, in fact. But, um, so my first point that I want us to just quickly look at how this father-son, spiritual father-son relationship developed. Firstly, Timothy caught Paul's eye. Timothy caught Paul's eye. His, the apostle, ministering, he's been sent out with, uh, with Barnabas, uh, ministering, great things are happening, uh, lives are being changed, miracles are taking place, people are getting saved, and he turns up at this little township called Lystra, Starts to minister and he notices this young man. Catches his eye. What do you think it might have been about Timothy that caught his eye? There's obviously something special that's going on about this within this young man's life. If you ever, you, you, you've met someone and you you just see something in their eyes, you, you know this this guy's turned on. This young lady's switched on. You know what I mean? Other people who think, not not that there's anyone home, the lights on in there somewhere. Now, no one like that in this congregation, I know. But uh, but there are times when you meet people like that. Well, Paul recognised and spotted something in this young man Timothy. There was something about Timothy that uh, that caught his eye. And the first thing I want to suggest, really, really briefly about this, is it it takes it takes a father to see potential. It takes a father. To see potential. You see, your leaders in this congregation, they've been out for a long time. In fact, we were here a couple of months ago for the 30th anniversary. That was a great, it was a great event. 30 years. You know, there are not many churches in Melbourne that have a senior pastor who's been the senior pastor for 30 years. That's the truth. It takes a farm to spot the teacher. Any young person, be it a guy or a girl. And uh, Paul saw something in this young man 
Something caught his eye, and there was something about Timothy. We notice in the, in the scripture it says he was what spoken of. It says the believers of this temple in Iconium spoke well of him. Now, just go on the journey with me a little bit. Here's Timothy in this little village called Lystra. But there's two villages, and they're separated by some 50 kilometers. People in two villages are saying, he's a good young man. Timothy's a good young man. How would they know that? How would the people in two villages know that Timothy was a good young man? Oh, by the way, when I, when I preach and teach, uh, I love feedback. And I, so I'm giving you permission to respond, okay? So how, how do you think it's likely possible that people in two villages, separated by some 50 kilometres, knew that Timothy was a good guy? Any suggestions? You're a very intelligent person, <laughs> well, I know that. Any suggestions? Why don't I give you some? <laughs> because it's Sunday morning. And it's, it's not too hot, but I appreciate that encouragement from the, from the worship band. I would suggest to you that uh, Timothy was active. He'd been, both, he'd been to both those villages already, serving the Lord. He'd been doing stuff, you know, putting out the seats, putting out the hymn books, probably, you know, hymn books back then. Maybe, uh, you know, they wouldn't have been PA either, but uh, he would have been doing stuff, all right? He was sharing his faith. They knew him because he was active. He was already doing stuff. You know, he wasn't sitting around like a dead fish waiting for something to happen. He was already in there. He was already active. He was already committed. And Paul could see this. There's something about this young kid. He starts asking, hey, that young guy that was in the church in the service this morning, who is he? Tell me about it. Oh, he's a good man. He's, he's out there. He goes to Iconium as well. And, you know, he, he, he works with him. He's, he's active. He's in there. He's, he's committed. Good young man. Paul says, I think there was something going on. I can see something. I want him to come with me. I want to take him with me. There's something in there I want to see. It takes a father to see potential and be willing to invest into that. I love what Andrew was talking about, the, uh, the three villages in Sri Lanka. I work with Compassion Australia. We release children from poverty in Jesus' name. That's exactly what we're doing. We're releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name by giving them and education. Get involved. Be active in whatever way that you can be in the way that this church is functioning in the Great Commission. So he was well spoken up by others. Timothy caught his eye. Let's, uh, let's move on because time is. Let's uh, add a few verses to a couple of lines. So in verse 3, Paul wanted to take him along uh, on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, excuse me, he's circumcised him? Are you kidding me? That's, that's fairly personal. And I would suggest painful. What the Jimmy is going on here? Well, let's, let's explore. Secondly, we're talking about the development of a relationship, a father-son relationship between Paul and Timothy. Timothy respected Paul's Greater wisdom. See, Paul was aware of the fact that uh, culturally, uh, the Jews that they were going to first, they were going to the synagogues to start off with the preaching, they all knew in that area that, uh, that while Timothy's mum was a, a Jewess, his dad was a Greek. Uh, the likelihood is that he hadn't been circumcised. And um, so Paul thinks, you know what? In light of the situation, we better get this done. Now, Guys, girls, you just sit back for a moment. Guys, if you were feeling the call to ministry and your senior pastor said, uh, look, um, I know we were in the gym the other night and I had the notice that, you know, I think we need to get the circumcised. What would your response be? I'd want to be pretty certain that this is definitely what God wants. That's, that's a very personal and a very painful thing to have done to an adult. Okay? So, but there's something about Timothy. He recognises Paul's greater wisdom in the situation. And he, 
He's willing. Wow. All power to him. He's willing. He submits himself to a very painful process. It's going to take him a little while to get over. Um, Paul's perspective was greater than Timothy's. Timothy on the back. And uh, there was a willingness in Timothy to do whatever was necessary. Now, it's not a decision, not an issue for us. That's not, that's never going to come. You are never going to be asked by Pastor David, Pastor Andrew, you know, hey buddy, you need to get saved. So that's not going to happen, okay? But there are other things that you might get challenged with. Could be all sorts of things. Could be the dress code. I, I, I hope I'm, I'm fitting the dress code today, Andrew. Uh, you know, some churches expect you to wear a suit and a tie. Most, uh, praise God, we've been polluted from that for the most part, but um, especially in a hot day like today. But there are other things that somebody needs to be aware of. There are expectations that are part and parcel of being involved in serving in God's house. There was a willingness on Timothy's part to do whatever. Are you willing to do whatever in order to serve in the house and to honour and respect the leadership that God has placed you under? That was the, the second point. Timothy respected Paul's great wisdom. Let's move on here. Verse 4 of that same chapter says, as they travel from town to town, so they've now they've gone, they've moved on. Uh, we presume we don't presume, we can be certain that Timothy now is with them. As they travel from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people who obey. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew daily in numbers. So thirdly, Timothy joined the team as a permanent travelling companion. So here's this young man now who's been well spoken of by the leaders at uh, both Lystra and Iconium. He's been serving faithfully, he's been active. Paul. The, the, the father, the spiritual father, the potential spiritual father has spotted that potential, has now taken him with them. He's now part of the team. Now, the interesting thing is we don't hear anything more about Timothy until the next chapter. We're going to move to that in a moment, chapter 17. But there is lots of different things that actually happen in the intervening period of time that uh, as you read through the book of Acts, that I'm just going to touch on briefly, we're going to look at them. The point here is that uh, Timothy was, well, firstly, there was the principle of association. So it's just traveling, spending time with someone. You, you pick up someone's heart just by being with them. And that's the process that's happening here. That's the principle that Jesus used in training the 12. And, uh, and secondly, he was, he was apparently just happy to learn in the background. Now, and I'll tell you why I think that's very clear in the story as you read through chapter 16 and 17. There's no apparent public ministry at this point in time for Timothy. We don't hear about it. But there's lots of things that happen. Let, let me give you some examples of some of the things that, that Timothy was experiencing but wasn't involved in public ministry. Uh, there's the story of Lydia's conversion in chapter 16 of Philip. I remember a fantastic story of this woman who's, uh, who's a Jewess, she's a business person, she sells cloth, purple cloth, and uh, she's, a, she's a mover and a shaker. And um, Paul discovers this prayer group. He goes and he preaches the gospel to them. And uh, Lydia gets converted. And uh, great things are beginning to happen. And then, and then Paul gets thrown into prison. This is all Timothy's. Involved in all this. He sees all this, but we just don't hear about it. But he sees it, he experiences it. Paul and Silas end up in prison. Timothy doesn't. But he's part of it. He's seen all this stuff. He's experienced it. Just in the background, learning the ropes, learning what it is to be in ministry, learning what it is to serve the Lord faithfully. Um, he observes the conversion of the Philippian jail. He sees all of that. He's, he's part of it. He's not in prison, but he's, he's there. He's experiencing all this stuff that God's doing. And then he also sees the Thessalonian and the Berean revivals that take place. So all of that happens in the second half of chapter 16, then as you get into the first half of chapter 17. So we don't hear about Timothy, but he's experiencing all of that stuff. He's seeing it. And it's having an impact on it. It's 
It's impressive that so he, he's watching Paul. He's watching how he ministers, how he operates. He's seeing the, the authority that he exercises, the, the situations that he gets himself into. Just like David, you know, uh, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, even though I end up in prison in, in Philippi, I'm not going to fear because God's with me. He experiences the reality of that happening. He sees it in, with his own eyes as Paul and Silas work their way through that. So he's happy to learn in the background. He's joined the team, principal of association, he's happy to learn in the background. No apparent public ministry that witnesses many things. It's impacting him deeply. Chapter 17, we meet Timothy again, verse 14. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with the instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So, paint the picture. There's been a, a brouhaha has happened at Berea. Um, Paul actually gets stoned. They think he's been killed. And uh, for God raised him up and uh, the, the brothers in the town of Berea realise the situation's been desperate. Let's get Paul out of here and, and uh, we'll, we'll leave Silas and Timothy can stay. Let's get Paul out and we'll take him to Athens and let things cool down a little bit. Very, very important thing that Timothy, that we see that Timothy learns in this situation. Timothy learned to function under delegated authority. He learned to function under delegated authority. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm so glad you asked and then sure. Uh, he understood the chain of command. In scripture, the word order of names is always exceptionally important. Uh, when you read about the team, it was, it was Paul, Silas, and Timothy. In fact, when the team, when Paul's team was first sent out, it was Barnabas and Paul. And then at some point, there was a change, and it became Paul and Barnabas. So Paul assumed the leadership of the team. And now, uh, Timothy's been added, so it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy. That's the, that's the order, that's the chain of command, if you like. Very important. Then, notice in verse 15, those who are scoring, well, Verse 14, but Silas and Timothy have stayed at Berea, and instructions are sent for Silas and Timothy to join. Very important point here, Silas is now in charge of the group. Saul is gone, he's in Athens, the Paul's in Athens. Silas has been given the responsibility of leading the team. Uh, the question is, this happens, believe me. I've been in pastoral ministry for nearly 40 years. This happens. When a leader goes on holidays, for example, somebody else is delegated to be in charge while they're gone. How do people handle that? Is there some people who think, oh, here's my opportunity to say my piece or to do my thing. I don't accept that person's authority. That can happen. It's a very, very human response. So what's Timothy's response going to be in this situation? Is he going to be able to sit comfortably under Silas' authority? He's been happy to be with Paul, but Paul's gone. Is he happy to sit under Silas' authority? Well, yes, he was. That's evident as you read through the story. But let me promise you that does not always happen in church life. Has that been your experience ever? I know he's got to be careful, but um, inside you're saying, yes, I know that's the truth. Often that's a challenge for every one of us. Are we comfortable to sit under somebody else's authority whom the recognised leader has placed in that role when the recognised leader is not there? That can be a major challenge in some people's lives. Fortunately, it wasn't so for Timothy. He understood the chain of command. He respected Silas' authority. We know that because of the way that the story continues to unfold. So let's move on. Uh, we go to chapter 18 of Acts. When Silas and Timothy 
came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. This is a, another really interesting point that comes out of this, uh, uh, out of this reference. Fifthly, Timothy understood the support ministry role. He understood the support ministry role. Let me uh, explain what I mean by that. You see, Paul was released to focus on preaching duties. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. You've got to read the few verses beforehand to, to recognize the reality of what's happening in this situation. Prior to Silas and Timothy coming back, Paul had actually been working as a tent maker. He'd been working because he had no support. This is a new town that he's born into, and uh, uh, Athens, he, he's had to work, and uh, he's working as a tent maker with Aquila and Priscilla. And, um, but when Silas and Timothy come back, Paul is released to full-time ministry again in preaching. Now, what's the underlying assumption? Let me ask, let me just paint the picture here. If, if Paul had the work, to support himself when he was on his own. And suddenly now there's three of them. There's Paul, there's Silas and Timothy, and Paul has been released to full-time ministry. Who's doing the working? Or the earning? Probably Silas and Timothy, or certainly Timothy. Does that make sense? If, if just follow my reasoning here, if Paul had to work when he was on his own, because he didn't have support. And now there's three of them. There's still a little bit of support. Paul's released to full-time ministry. Somebody else must be doing the work. Does that make sense? I remember sharing this with a bunch of pastors once in India, not many years ago, in fact. And I noticed there was a series of seminars that we did with pastors in a, in a, a range of different areas. And every time we got to that point, there was talking that went on in the, in the curry at all these pastors and, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I asked my interpreter after about the third day of seeing this kind of a video, like, he said, oh, they're, they're not really agreeing with you. <laughs> because they've been taught that once you put your hand in the plow, you never turn back. Now, I agree with that principle, but I think it was misapplied in that situation. That uh, you do whatever you've got to do. If, if you run out of money, if you're in ministry, and I've been in this situation, if, you, if you're in ministry and you run out of money, what do you do? You go and work. You earn some money so you can live, so you continue your ministry. Okay? That's what Paul was going to do. And we just have to face the reality of our situations at times. Well, Timothy, I'm suggesting, understood the support ministry role. At least he was doing some work in order to fund the team. Maybe it was Silas and Timothy who were, probably were, who were working to fund the team at that point in time. Uh, but Timothy understood the support ministry role. Really, really important thing to understand. Let's move on. Acts 19. This is Paul. He sends two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. What is going on here? Is Paul sending out Timothy and Erastus? Remember, the word order is extremely important in Scripture. Who's in charge here now? It's, it's Timothy, okay? So, sixthly, Timothy is given the opportunity to lead a small ministry team of his own. He's He's earned the respect, he's earned the, the right, the opportunity now to actually lead a team in his own right. It's Timothy and Erastus who Paul sends out to minister into this situation. Learning, and here he is learning responsibility and leadership in a minor but real situation. One of the things that a, a real father does, it isn't just to throw a son to the wolves, but to make sure that they have the support make sure they've had the training they need and then give them a smaller role to cut their teeth on them and learn practically exactly what leadership is all about. You learn responsibility and leadership in a, a, a minor but real situation. Let's move on. 
Acts 20. Because some Jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Phyllis, from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. So here's another really interesting situation. There's a bunch of people. These are all sons in the faith of Paul. Timothy's just simply one of the bunch. And uh, uh, he goes back and he's, uh, he's accompanied with this, this whole group. And guess what? Timothy is there in the group. What does that tell us about Timothy? There's something I suggest that's really important. Number seven, Timothy comfortably fitted back into the larger team setting. What do I mean by that? Again, from personal experience, when you give someone leadership responsibilities, and you take it off them for whatever reason, how is he going to handle it? How would you handle it? How have you handled that in the past, perhaps? Have you been given a responsibility for whatever reason? Uh, circumstances, situations change that responsibility, you're relieved of that responsibility, how do you cope with it? Timothy seemed to handle it quite well. Yeah. And he was content to just be one of the team again. Because that's what was needed in that situation. He fulfilled the role. He led that small ministry team. It seems like it was a success. He comes back to the bigger team. Uh, does he is he sort of gonna know, hey, well, I'm you know, I'm the I'm the big man here. I, I hope did, did that for Paul, you know, I need a special role here again. No, he, he seemed to be quite happy just to fit back into the big team again. Because that's what was needed in that situation. He didn't have the Diotrephes complex. We read it, which we're going to read very quickly, just so that we uh, get a clear picture of what's being spoken of here. What we, what we mean by the Diotrephes complex. And it's in 3 John and uh, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to attempt to read this without my glasses, which I forgot to bring with me. Uh, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. Timothy did not have the Diotrephes conference. Uh, I've encountered a few Diotrephes in my time. In fact, I, as I think back, there's been times when I have struggled with the Diotrephes complex. So I have to be totally honest with you. God uses the experience of the life and ministry to beat that sort of stuff out of us. <laughs> Timothy was happy to fit back into the team because that's what was needed in that context. Let's move on. Timothy has proved himself because he, as a son with his father, has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy is now, he's now a proven son in the Lord. He's been a journey. He's learned the lessons. He's been through the whole process. He's now a proven son in the Lord. To Paul, his true heart is revealed through his consistent service. I want you to just think about that for a minute. His true heart is revealed through his consistent service. Consistency. It's called faithfulness. It's going to refer to the Spirit. Consistency in faithful service. And uh, finally, but you, man of God, this is out of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness. This is Paul now writing to Timothy who has been given the responsibility of pastoring the church at Ephesus. Big church at this point in time. An important church. Timothy has been given responsibility for this big church that Paul had been involved in planting many years earlier now. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. 
take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. A fantastic affirmation that the Apostle is making for his true son in the faith now, Timothy. He's given him this major, big church, big responsibility. Go and look after this church. There's got some problems. I want you to go in there and uh, help them to get themselves sorted out. Timothy has become a man of God, given major responsibility. So notice in verse 2 he says, but you, man of God. He's not just a true son of the faith, he's a man of God in his own right. Timothy has become a man of God, given major responsibility. He is now a man who Paul can confidently trust to represent his heart to the congregations. Fantastic journey. Just revealed as we journey with this young man, Timothy, through the book of Acts. Just looking at the different times his name is mentioned, and see what's going on around his life at that time. We see this picture, this development, this uh, amazing development of a father, spiritual father-son relationship that took an, quite a number of years to develop. But the result was uh, phenomenally effective. Oh, I'm going to finish here. Just simply talking about raising sons and daughters in the faith. My, my challenge for each one of us here today, and I'm including myself in this, my challenge for each one of us, where do you sit at the moment in relation to you being a son or a daughter in the faith, in this house? Where do you sit in that process? My hope would be that you're someone who's totally committed, you're involved. If that's the case, fantastic, keep going for it. God's going to open up other opportunities. We know there's been many people over the 30 years that this church has been functioning, there's been many people that have been sent out from this church into ministry that are going on, ministry that's uh, continuing in other places as a result of the ministry that the fathers of this house put into those men and women. Many people have gone out. Praise God. You could be one of those two being sent out to start something else, to do something else, to work somewhere else, going out with the blessing of the house, having been raised up in the house. You could be one who's started down that journey and maybe, maybe got a little bit weary, maybe got a little bit brown off thinking, you know, you know what, this is pretty hard work, but I don't really think I'm being appreciated here. You know, I was given a role and they took it away from me. And you know what, I think that stinks. And, um, well, my prayer for you would be just briefly what might be known in your life. What is God trying to do in your life at this point in time? Because, you know, we have the awesome privilege being a part of the greatest enterprise that is going on on the face of the earth right now. It's the building of Jesus' church. We have this awesome privilege of being a part of that. Raising sons and daughters in the faith. Where are you sitting in that process? What's God challenging you about? this morning, about what you could do, what your response should be, could be, should be, in this process. Let's pray to God. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word again, simply just looking at the story.